Good afternoon. Um, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in Brandtone uh, and more specifically what we're doing in the area of healthcare. And I think it's, it's actually very appropriate to recognize that the reason we're giving this talk here today at the Web Summit is because of a cup of coffee we had with Charlotte Hubbard from the Gates Foundation exactly this time last year here at the Web Summit. And out of that conversation has come a whole program of work that we are working, uh, that we are undertaking together with the Gates Foundation in helping deliver effective family planning in key developing and emerging markets. So when we think about the future of our planet, when we think about the future of our businesses, when we think about the future our children might have, we think about many things. But one thing we always think about is the future of the developing and the emerging markets. And why is that? Well, if we take just 12 countries, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Russia, Brazil, India, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, and Myanmar, take just those 12 countries, 50% of the world's population live in those 12 countries, three and a half billion people. These countries, on average, are showing 5% economic growth over the last decade. They are the engine of economic development on the planet at the moment. The purchasing power of consumers in those 12 markets is going to increase from about $14 trillion today to $25 trillion within five years. In short, the next one billion middle-class consumers live in those 12 countries. So whether you're in government, whether you're an NGO, whether you're in business, whether you're in the environmental movement, this is one of the key drivers. It's the most important thing, I would argue. And when you think about these consumers, these new middle-class consumers, they're already buying branded consumer goods, laundry, personal care, food, etc. But increasingly, they're starting to spend the available income they have on education for their children, health care for their families, and financial services to assure their future in older life. And this is having a profound effect on all sectors, but I, th I would argue it will have a very profound effect on the healthcare sector over the next number of decades. And when we look at these markets and we think about what technologies and what infrastructure are available to deliver consumer services, education, healthcare, or finance, we very quickly arrive at the conclusion that the most important, most modern, most prevalent infrastructure available in this market is, or in these markets is mobile. So in those 12 markets that I mentioned, there is 90% mobile penetration. So nine out of 10 people own a mobile phone. Now 95% of these phones are prepaid and 77% of them are basic handsets. But the rate of smartphone adoption is very high and many of these networks are better than the networks you have in developed markets because they're newer. So these networks are getting smarter and they're getting faster, and more, quite importantly too, they're also getting cheaper. And so we think about the fu our future in mobile in the developed markets. In fact, it could be argued, and I think it will be the case, that some of the most innovative things that happen in mobile in terms of the way we live our lives will in fact happen in the developing and the emerging markets sooner than they happen in our markets. And I, d I think it's very fair argument that you'll see that nowhere more so than in healthcare. Why? There's nothing else. There's no option. Okay? When we think about healthcare and the developing and the emerging markets, myself as, as not a healthcare professional and no training in healthcare, I would think about the crisis there has been in these markets in the key life-threatening diseases, AIDS, malaria, and TB. 
And while this is and remains a huge crisis, and there is much to be done, I think it's also fair to say that there has been tremendous progress with governments, NGOs, commercial organizations, citizens working together to address this issue. And that probably for the first time in the recent past allows us to think about what might be next, okay? This is still a crisis, still worthy of huge attention and focus, but you can start to think, probably for the first time, about what's next and the opportunities. And from our point of view, healthcare, the provision of healthcare now becomes much more critically about a path out of poverty towards sustainable health, a better quality of health through technology and through the absence of vested interests that may be even available to us in 10 years in our markets. And key to that is the delivery of personalized information, underpinning informed choice, and the technology that will enable that is without doubt mobile. So when we had this conversation with the Gates Foundation, what they started telling us, and some of you may know this already, and if you do, forgive me, but for me, this was very, very interesting. What we came to realize in working with the foundation was the following. If a, a woman has 10 children in 10 years, she, her husband, and those 10 children, they're doomed to poverty. There's no way out. Her health gradually de decays over that 10 years. That family can't afford to feed those 10 children. Those children don't get the education they need, and they're consigning another generation to being trapped in poverty. If, on the other hand, that woman has access to informed, voluntary family planning, then she and her husband or she and her partner can decide, or she alone indeed, can decide to space out her children every three years, let's say, and have three children in 10 years. Now that family and that woman has the opportunity to recover her health between childbirths, has the opportunity to invest in the necessary nutrition for early life health, a foundation for lifelong health, has the opportunity to educate her children, and has the opportunity to break the cycle of poverty. I go back to my original point. If that woman has 10 children in 10 years, she, she remains poor, and most of her children will remain poor despite the increasing affluence of the society around them. So in this context, we've been working with the Gates Foundation to understand how we can use mobile to support the introduction on a large scale of a low-cost, self-injectable, long-term contraceptive. And you can see a picture of the device here. It's like a little bubble of jelly with a needle on it. You stick it in your arm. I wouldn't, of course, but a woman would stick it in her arm, press the bubble, and she's got three months contraceptive protection. And together in a, a cooperation between the Gates Foundation and Pfizer, these are available at a dollar a dose at, at the present time, which is very affordable. But here's the point. You can have the ambition, you can have the technology, but unless you can supply this with information that represents the ability for that individual to make a free, informed choice, then you can't ethically bring it to the market. The person has to know what they're doing and has to be in a position to make an informed choice. So the barrier here is no longer the technology or the cost, it's the ability to deliver personalized information to the user of that solution. And in the markets we're talking about, the only answer is mobile. It's the only answer. Everything else is too hard, too expensive, too open to corruption, and all the other stuff. So remember, mobile is, on one hand, a technical enabler, but it's also the ethical enabler. Because even if you can do it, you shouldn't do it unless the person has the information to use it properly, effectively, and by means of that, a free choice about that use. We're rolling this program out initially in Nigeria. 
um, together with um, our partners there, DKT and uh, Pfizer and uh, UCSF, who are doing the, the, the societal uh, analytics on this with us. And we're really, really excited about this. Because if women can be enabled to have, through the power of mobile, the ability to buy the product, register on their phone, tell us a little bit about themselves, then based on that profile, we can then support that woman through the use of that product. We can inform her about the choice she's making or help inform her about the choice she's making. We can inform her about the alternatives. We can remind her about reuse. And we can support her on her journey. And we're very excited about that. And you know, maybe you'll come back next year, we let you know how that's, that's progressing. We're also working with some of our other clients in, in, in related activities. One of them is early life health education for mothers in countries like Indonesia and Kenya. Also, education for mothers who have children with asthma. Again, all of this is based on engaging that consumer on their phone, profiling them, and then helping them make informed and therefore ethical decisions about healthcare. Another project we're working on with another client is access to modern pharmacies and clinics for the urban poor. If you open a modern pharmacy in, in a relatively poor area of a city in a developing market, let's say, take for example, Kenya. That's a picture of a pharmacy from Kenya. A lot of the pharmacies in Kenya are in fact unregulated stores that sell drugs. Often those drugs are counterfeit. Often they'll sell you a partial treatment if you have only partial payment and a whole range of other not so fantastic activities. But on the other hand, if you were just to build a modern pharmacy there and invite people to come in and give them very powerful drugs, is that ethical or effective if they can't read the label? If they don't understand how powerful these drugs are, if they aren't in effect supported to use these products in the way that you and I would be able to ring a pharmacy any time of day and night and get advice, ring our family doctor, get advice, even ring our parents who would be used to using these, these drugs. So part of what we do in, in this context, the idea is that the phone goes home with the person who's bought these products from the pharmacy and supports their effective use of them, thereby making it an ethical intervention. So our message ultimately is that mobile engagement is key to ethical and effective delivery of modern healthcare and modern healthcare education in the developing and the emerging markets. And it's a huge opportunity. And I think it's one that many of you might be interested in. And if you aren't, I think you should look at it because I think it's going to be a fantastic opportunity to do good and do well for many organizations, whether they be commercial or voluntary or governmental. And one final point we'd make is that if any of you look at the delivery of financial services uh, as, a, uh, as a product in the developing and emerging markets, because of the absence of a traditional banking infrastructure, mobile is the main way it's done. And there you're seeing tremendously innovative solutions in the developing and emerging markets in mobile banking and mobile money. Those markets are significantly further ahead in adoption and innovation than we are in the developed markets. And my prediction is you'll see some of the most innovative and effective uses of mobile and healthcare delivery in the developing markets, and we'll be back adopting them in five to 10 years, like we are mobile money. Everybody gets so cool, oh, so cool, I can move money to somebody on a phone. I've been doing that in Kenya for 15 years. It's actually the only way you move money in Kenya. So I think it's very worthwhile keeping an eye on this, and it could be a very, very interesting area. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoy your time here in Dublin.